Welcome to episode 227 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share five things teachers wish their administrators knew. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. I want to thank Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. You can earn graduate credits or CEUs through over 280 online PD courses in 20 different subject areas for K-12 teachers. Everything is online and self-paced, and you have six months to complete. Right now, you can save 20% off any course with the code TRUTH. That's less than $120 per graduate credit hour. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com. Teachers, listen up. If you're looking to lift up your students in a new way, then you've got to check out the Redbird Adaptive Math and ELA program. Redbird bundles from McGraw-Hill are as little as $40 for the year per five students and covers curriculum in grades three through eight. That's $40 for the year. The Redbird curriculum features the latest in adaptive instruction, gamification, and digital project-based learning to meet both national and state standards. Accelerate your students' learning with something different and fun. Check out Redbird today. Go to meheonline.com slash redbird1 and get $5 off your classroom bundle. That's M-H-E for McGraw-Hill Education, online.com slash redbird1. Remember, Redbird bundles are as little as $40 for the year for five students, making it perfect for intervention or acceleration. Check out Redbird today at meheonline.com slash redbird1 and get $5 off your classroom bundle. That's MHE for McGraw-Hill Education, online.com slash redbird1. There's a lot of talk right now about the teacher shortage crisis and the teacher attrition crisis. And this all started before COVID in many areas, but the oftentimes chaotic and unpredictable approach to remote and hybrid learning this past year has made the situation even more dire. And I can tell for sure when I listen to teachers that many more folks are planning to quit or retire early when this school year comes to an end. So what does this mean for the teachers that stay? How can schools keep their best teachers and attract more incredible folks to the profession? Obviously, this is a highly complex issue with many factors at play, but many teachers are really happy in their work. And I think there's something to be learned from that. There are many teachers who feel supported and have the ability to be creative and innovative in their approach, who are able to focus on what's best for kids and aren't bound to excessive and unnecessary paperwork or meetings. And what I notice when observing teachers is that these conditions generally are not present district-wide. Some districts do have higher teacher satisfaction levels and levels of morale than others, but working conditions and morale vary tremendously from school to school, even between schools in the same neighborhood, serving the same demographics. It's fascinating to me to consider why that is. Why teachers at two schools in the same community, same district, same curriculum, same tests, can have wildly different teacher retention and satisfaction rates. And I think principals and assistant principals are the linchpins. Strong administrative leadership can make a massive, massive difference for retaining teachers, and therefore a massive difference in ensuring that students have caring, effective, engaging instruction. As the saying goes, people don't quit jobs. They quit leaders. They quit bosses. And as someone who has worked for some awesome principals, some mediocre ones, and some that were absolutely terrible, I can tell you that my actual job description and duties weren't really that different from one principal to the next. When I was unhappy and when I requested a transfer, it was never because of teaching. It was because of the school culture and leadership around teaching. And what this means, at least to me, is that we don't have to completely overhaul every single aspect of the school bureaucracy in order to better support teachers and kids. Now, that is a lovely and worthwhile goal to work toward, for sure. 
But in the meantime, we're losing our best teachers and we're killing the love of learning in children. We need immediate solutions as well. We need practical, actionable things that can be done to make teaching a more sustainable career even within our current systems. I believe that there are leadership principles that any admin can internalize and apply to immediately help their faculty feel better supported and create more manageable expectations. So I'm going to share some of these principles in today's episode through the lens of what teachers have told me they wish their administrators understood. I have surveyed teachers about this multiple times over the last few years, including during pandemic teaching, and I always see the same issues and patterns come up. Almost everything teachers say in response to what do you want your admins to know is some variation of or an offshoot of these five overarching statements that I'm about to share with you. And I feel really confident that these are the things that can help in schools of any educator who's listening to this. The first thing that teachers wish their admins knew was that teachers are craving autonomy and respect for their professional judgment. We're living in a time in which the educational pendulum has swung towards student-directed learning and giving kids choice and differentiating everything that happens in the classroom for individual student needs. And yet, we see the opposite movement for teachers, who are increasingly micromanaged and given one-size-fits-all professional development. They're sitting through meetings that don't pertain to them. They're told they have to teach the exact same lessons as all their team members and give all the same homework assignments that everyone else gives. The smallest decisions about their classroom setup, their instructional style, everything is decided for them. And teachers are deeply missing a sense of autonomy the feeling that their professional judgment is respected. It can often feel like the system is constraining all teachers out of the fear that someone will do something terrible and a scandal will wind up on the nightly news. So everyone has to have their lesson plans checked weekly because a handful of teachers are winging it or have insufficient or inappropriate plans. Everyone has to sit on, on a training because a handful of folks aren't following a policy. Everyone has to get an email reminder about report cards being due because a handful of folks never turn theirs in on time. And these practices lead to staff feeling micromanaged and mistrusted. And what that means is when you feel micromanaged and mistrusted, your innovation and your creative thinking are stifled. So if we want teachers to be on the cutting edge in their instruction, if we want them to experiment, to try new approaches, to be creative in their teaching, they must feel that their administrators believe in them and give them space to be themselves. So the solution here, if we're talking about what leaders can do to give teachers this autonomy and respect for their professional judgment, is to treat all teachers like your best teachers and provide individualized support to those who need it. So work from a basis of trust until that trust is broken. Don't create additional work for teachers to be, quote, fair, or micromanage everyone to ensure that new teachers or struggling teachers are doing what they're supposed to. We do not have to accept the premise that excessive paperwork, excessive documentation, excessive testing, and excessive meetings are unavoidable in education. It's just not true. Every teacher does not have to submit detailed lesson plans to administration. Every school does not have to mandate multiple committee meetings. Every teacher does not have to spend hours a day on communication with parents and paperwork. There are countless schools in which leaders have already found more effective, efficient approaches to their workflow. And we owe it to our kids and teachers to innovate in this area and catch up. The majority of a teacher's tasks can and should be completed during the contractual day. And as a school leader, you have the power to support teachers in that. It's a process of counting the cost of what we're asking teachers to do and beginning to determine which things are worth it and which are not. So this means if teachers are saying yes to changing out hallway bulletin board displays every month, then they're saying no to an opportunity to grade papers and give kids timely feedback on their work. If they're saying yes to an additional meeting, then they're saying no to lesson preparation for the next day and no to higher quality instruction. If they're saying yes to hours of catching up on schoolwork every weekend, then they're saying no to their families, to their health, to their personal development, to their mental clarity. 
So my advice is to be really cautious about how many initiatives your school takes on at one time, or adding a layer of accountability and paperwork without a plan for when teachers will complete it. We want teachers to accomplish the bulk of their tasks during their paid working hours. The things they do on their own time for free should be primarily things they choose to do, hobby-based work, based on their interests, like attending extracurriculars with students, or finding fun lesson ideas online, or participating in PD opportunities like Twitter chats or professional book clubs. Those are the things, these choices that teachers voluntarily do, should be the things that they're doing on their own time. And the majority of their tasks should be done during that 40-hour or whatever your contractual work hour week is. So that's one way to think about teachers' autonomy and professional judgment. Let's move on to the next thing that teachers wish their administrators knew. It's that teachers need uninterrupted planning time in order to be at their best for students. It is impossible to teach well for six hours straight. No one can be on that long five days a week without losing their energy, their patience, and possibly their temper. And yet most teachers are barely getting a 30-minute duty-free lunch, much less their designated planning time. And they're running copies and returning parent phone calls during that time anyway. Now, teacher contracts generally specify several hours of planning time per week, during the school day, before school, after school, and so on. So why isn't it happening? Well, a big part of the problem with planning time is the nationwide substitute shortage and budget constraints. This leads to teachers covering one another's classes and or missing out on planning time because a specials teacher is absent or the specials teacher, art, music, PE, and so on, are pulled to supervise testing or some other duty that's outside of their normal teaching job that pulls them away from their classroom and creating this ripple effect. So planning time is in the schedule, but it ends up not happening. Also, there's been a growing push from higher-ups at the district, state, and federal level, as well as from parents, to, quote, hold teachers accountable for how their time is being used. And this ties into that fear-based retraction of autonomy that I mentioned previously, in which we cannot possibly allow teachers an entire 45 minutes to work alone in their classrooms after school. Oh, we can't do that. They, they might leave early. They might just scroll through Instagram on their phones. What if they don't use that time wisely? So there's significant pressure on administrators to fill every minute of a teacher's time with meetings, committees, student supervision duties, and so on to prove to outsiders that teachers are earning their taxpayer-funded salaries. And fortunately, administrators hold tremendous power to disrupt this narrative. We as educators all know that three of the most important aspects of a teacher's job are planning high-quality instruction, delivering high-quality instruction, and assessing student learning. And we know that none of these things can happen if teachers don't have time to do them. They need time during the school day away from their students in which they can reflect on the effectiveness of their teaching and plan their next steps. So if we truly believe this, then we have to communicate this to community stakeholders. If we truly believe that rigorous lesson planning and assessment are instrumental for student success, we cannot let teachers do all of it on their own unpaid time. So the solution is to find creative ways to provide class coverage and protect teachers' planning time. We have to give them the time during the school day where they can sit and focus on this kind of thing and not just hope that they can find time on their evenings and weekends amongst all of their caretaking and other responsibilities. So even if there's a shortage of substitutes, teachers can't be expected to routinely cover their absent colleagues' classes. This has become the norm in many schools, and often it's unpaid. I can tell you that teachers who are regularly voluntold <laughs> to give up their planning time are almost always on the verge of quitting. If this is a regular expectation in your school, I promise you changing this expectation next school year will instantly left morale, will instantly improve the quality of instructional delivery because you're giving teachers that break in the middle of the day. They have to have that time to not be on for students, to be able to sit in a quiet classroom and get their own work done so they can be present for students for the rest of the day. So find another way to get coverage. 
staff can work together to brainstorm solutions that would work in your specific school and district. You could consider hiring hourly staff to do these kinds of duties. Some schools have um, like an aide that's there from 10 to 2 every single day to help cover classes as needed. You can have non-instructional faculty, including the administrative team, rotate in and fill in for teachers. You can have administrators supervise the kids for an extra assembly or a longer recess period or some other kind of special event so that teachers have additional time to work in their classrooms. Maybe they do have to cover for a colleague, but then there's that assembly in the afternoon in which all the kids are um, outside, they're in the cafeteria, they're in the gym, someone else is taking over those supervision duties, and teachers can then use that as their work time. Any effort you make to show teachers that you understand the value of their planning time as an administrator and that you're doing everything you can to protect that planning time will be so appreciated. Any step in this direction. I know it is not easy. It has to be done. At least an attempt, a step toward this has to be done. And that also includes examining how many meetings are required before and after school, as well as during planning time. Most meetings in schools are either unnecessary or last twice as long as they should. That's been my personal observation. Some schools do this really well, but a lot of times we're working off of really old standards about why meetings are necessary and we're not really using all of the different communication tools that we have available to us so we don't have to spend so much time sitting in these synchronous meetings. Many teachers are required to be on multiple unpaid committees and they attend five or more niche level meetings. So maybe PLCs, grade level or subject area, student data analysis, and so on. They are swamped in meetings. They're talking about the work but never having time to actually do the work. And it doesn't have to be this way. There are relatively simple solutions for reducing meetings, for streamlining committee work, and otherwise protecting teachers' time before and after school. But as an administrator, you must be committed to this. The goal must be to allow teachers as much unstructured time as possible during their contractual hours. We want to reduce how often teachers are mandated to complete specific tasks during a given block of non-instructional time, and instead provide as much autonomy as possible so they can tackle their workload in a way that makes sense to them. And if you have teachers who struggle with that, you can provide individual support to those teachers rather than trying to micromanage everyone. You're going to get so much better results, and school morale will lift instantly. The third thing that teachers wish their administrators knew is that teachers need admins to have their backs and support them when their professionalism is undermined. One of the main reasons that teachers quit is because they don't feel like their principals and APs care about them or support them. They report having the sense that their admins are simply passing down directives from the superintendent or other higher-ups without considering how that's going to impact teachers and their workloads and without explaining the why behind new requirements. Teachers are often presented with mandates that don't make sense to them, and they're not offered an opportunity to understand the bigger picture and help brainstorm possible alternative ways to meet the intended outcome in order to streamline it. So the school culture is often authoritarian in nature. It's do what I say and don't ask why. Questioning me is insubordination. Versus a culture that fosters creativity, critical thinking, and innovation. As in, I'd love for you to help me think of some alternative approaches that are more efficient and that will help free up your planning time. This strong desire that teachers feel to know that their leadership team has their back, that's the phrase that comes up over and over again. I want them to have our backs. This also applies to interactions with students' parents and family members. Sometimes teachers feel like admins will agree to parental requests with no acknowledgement of the impact of those requests on a teacher's workload. They might also feel that their school leaders, quote, throw them under the bus when parents complain. So the solution here is to remember that your job as the school leader is to support your teacher so that it's easier for them to do their job well. Administrators often feel caught in the middle, trying to please their supervisors and folks at the district and state level, while also keeping teachers and families and students happy. And this is an impossible task because there's no way to please everyone. What the kids like, the parents aren't going to like. What the teachers like, the, supervisor, the superintendent isn't going to like. It's really a very, very difficult job. But 
administrators can choose to make more decisions based not on fear and not on people-pleasing, but on a set of clearly communicated core values that are tied to the school's vision and mission. Administrators have a significant amount of power to protect their teachers from harmful mandates and outdated, inefficient bureaucracies that don't serve their best interests or those of the students. Leaders are the linchpins with a strong capability to disrupt the status quo and reimagine systems in ways that simplify the workload for every person in the building. So what does this look like? Well, a general principle of good leadership, not just in education in any field, is never shift blame to your staff when a client or a stakeholder is upset. Take responsibility for the problem where relevant for the things that you have control over and avoid bashing the teacher in front of the stakeholder. So you can privately reprimand the teacher. You can issue consequences needed if needed later on. But except in instances of truly abhorrent negligence and harm on the part of a teacher, you want to present a unified front. And to do otherwise undermines the authority of the teacher with that parent or stakeholder. So that means the next time there's a problem, the parent isn't going to think that the teacher has any kind of authority or professionalism or, or judgment. So they will disrespect the teacher and then go over the teacher's head again to you for intervention, which continually uplevels the problem. And that creates this whole thing where the teacher is trapped in the cycle of like fear and walking on eggshells and you're constantly just dealing with unhappy parents. You want parents to believe that the teacher is trustworthy and competent. And then you can provide support to the teacher behind the scenes to make sure that's actually true. The goal is to actively look for ways to support your teachers and remove obstacles from their past, remove the things that keep them from doing their best work. Sometimes that means reducing obligations on their time. Sometimes it means shielding them from bureaucratic mandates from the district. Sometimes it means taking ownership of a tough parent situation so the teacher can relax enough to create and innovate in the classroom without distraction and fear. In this way, teachers will not feel like your underlings or assistants who are just there to carry out whatever work needs to be done by the principal or the district. This approach frees teachers to focus not on jumping through hoops for admin, not on doing a dog and pony show, but on providing the best possible education to children. So the job of an administrator is rather simple in this regard. Do everything you possibly can to help teachers with their jobs. And this mindset shift, which sounds kind of obvious, but actually isn't really in practice many times, will completely transform the way you run your school. It will transform the rapport you have with your teachers. You will not have to come up with gimmicky ways to show teachers appreciation. You will not have to pry into their personal lives to try to build rapport and relationships. When teachers see that you genuinely want to support them and that you are working hard to simplify their jobs, they will respect you and they will feel more comfortable being honest with you about what they need. The fourth thing that teachers wish their admins knew is that teachers need school leaders to provide the necessary support and resources for students to be successful or adjust expectations to align with reality. Now, that's a mouthful, here's what I mean. As our schools and society become more adept at identifying special needs and moving away from that one-size-fits-all education, we're learning more about mental health issues, neurodivergent thinking, and so on. We realize that we can't just meet the needs of all kids through one method of instruction, and that's a good thing. It's only a problem when teachers are expected to differentiate and individualize for too many students in too many ways simultaneously without the support, the training, or the resources needed. What's happening is folks making decisions at the federal, state, and sometimes district level have very little, if any, understanding of the true complexity of teaching, especially if they are politicians. They tend to issue sweeping decrees and then leave it up to individual educators to, quote, make it work or, quote, just figure it out. And we saw that last summer, right, with like the reopening schools. Like, we don't know how we're going to keep people safe. We're not going to issue any guidelines. We're not going to give you any materials to help like distance kids or put up any kind of barriers. We won't give you masks or cleaning supplies. 
Just make it work. Just figure it out, right? That's just one example of like 50 million in education, right? And so when this happens enough times over the course of many years, it's really hard to draw any conclusion other than these folks, these higher up folks, know this is impossible. They know this ask cannot be done. They know we're not going to be successful at it. They have no idea how it could possibly work. And frankly, they don't care. They know if they don't give specifics, they can just blame administrators and teachers when the outcome is a dumpster fire. And so schools are continually being set up to fail. They're being asked to do the impossible. And no matter what they accomplish, it won't ever be seen as enough. It won't ever be celebrated. So while we do need to hold high expectations, we do need to continually improve. We shouldn't settle for less than what's possible. We also need to be mindful of the toll that this takes on morale within the school. It is exhausting to continually work toward nearly impossible goals that have been set for you, not with you. And this is especially true when so many of the factors determining success are completely out of your hands. And when you know that meeting the goal imposed on you will only result in the expectations being raised to an even higher level. Oh, so you were able to accomplish this? Great, now you can handle that. This cycle is a major part of what causes teachers as well as school leaders to burn out and give up. The pressure placed on educators is also felt by students, and the incessant need to be exponentially improving can cause students to give up and drop out. So we must refuse to put such a high level of pressure on teachers and school leaders in every aspect of their jobs. They can't do all of that. And instead, choose a few essential areas for them to focus on. We must make a conscious decision that some tasks in the workload are lower priorities and encourage educators to do fewer things better. Now, these are countercultural beliefs. Most school districts don't operate under this viewpoint. So these things will not be easy to do. You will not be easy to use these as guiding principles in your decision making. However, it is critical if we want to reduce teacher attrition and support our best teachers and principals in being successful. The administrative team in a school is the de facto intermediary between district leaders and teachers. So admins have some power to question bureaucratic norms and brainstorm alternatives to the status quo that work better for teachers and kids. The solution is to conduct a time audit to understand where resources and energy are being allocated and explicitly take something off of staff's plates whenever something new is added. So a big focus in my 40-hour workweek program, both the existing version for teachers and the one for school leaders that's coming out this summer, is understanding where time is being spent and where it should be spent in order to really move the needle for kids. And yes, if you haven't heard this, 40-hour leadership is finally coming to life, and I'll talk more about that toward the end of this episode. Rather than just doing what's always been done, while continually adding to it and filling in gaps haphazardly, we start from the baseline in the program and we analyze what's truly necessary and effective. Doing everything well is not only impossible, it's unnecessary. The responsibilities that are only marginally impactful in a school are distracting. They're causing resources to be spread too thin. And they're preventing people from giving their all in the areas that could exponentially increase impact on student learning. So administrators can remove the least important tasks from their own plates and from teachers' plates in order to free up everyone to focus on the most important initiatives. Leaders can reimagine systems in ways that simplify and reduce the workload for every person in the building. So admins can take the time to complete time audits like the one in the 40-hour leadership program where you're asking, what are the biggest priorities? What things should get the majority of teachers' focus and energy? And what things should be eliminated or streamlined or put on the back burner for a little while in order to free up time and attention for what kids most need us to do? Now, I'm going to make a really important point here that, I, that cannot be lost when we're talking about this topic. We have to understand that teachers' unpaid work hours are not free labor for the school. The way that we do school now is dependent upon teachers working for free on the evenings and weekends. If teachers were to stop doing this, all teachers all together, the entire system would collapse. 
because so much work is being done for free via committees, via extra duties, just lesson planning and grading. The system would collapse without teachers' free labor. And what we're hitting on now is after years and years and years of taking advantage of teachers, we're discovering that there is actually a limit to the amount of time that a human being can spend working without compensation or reward or recognition or advancement. There is a breaking point beyond which teachers' goodwill and genuine concern for students can't be stretched. And this past school year was beyond the breaking point for a lot of folks. So we have to work from the understanding that every expectation placed on teachers requires an expenditure of their time and energy. We can't lose sight of that. The school pays a price for that labor, even if, and sometimes especially if, teachers are not paid directly for that time. It's not free. You're paying the cost in terms of burnout. So a good principle to follow is this. Each time a school leader adds something to teachers' plates, take something else off. So if you're introducing a new data collection or analyzation system, figure out the overlap with the old system and explicitly tell teachers, you no longer need to do this. Or the district wants us to be doing this now, and I know that you're also trying to do this, this, and this, which accomplish similar objectives. Which one of these measures is least helpful and effective for you? Which one of these is actually not really giving you that much input on what your students know? Okay, let's cut that one out, and then we can focus on this new data collection system. Remember, the role of a school leader is to support teachers by making their work easier. The best bosses in any profession are constantly checking in with their employees to make sure that they're feeling well, that they have the resources and support they need, to make sure they understand what's expected of them, to make sure their employees believe they can be successful. If teachers view their principal as someone who just adds more work to their plate, they will avoid and resent that person. It's just like a marriage or a romantic partnership, right? If the only time your partner speaks to you is when they want something from you, you will stop wanting to share any of your feelings or experiences with them. You'll tense up around them and you'll avoid them. So a big part of the solution for administrators is to be mindful when they are assigning tasks to teachers or creating procedures and view their role as a leader through the lens of making teaching easier. It is a complex complicated job that takes up a lot of time. What can you do as a school leader to simplify it? The goal is to remove as many obstacles from teachers' paths as possible so they can focus on high-quality teaching and learning. The final thing that teachers wish their administrators knew is that an organized, efficient school leadership team with clear priorities has a tremendous positive impact on the entire school. Now, this sounds obvious, but administrators, like teachers, are rarely trained in efficient workflows. None of us in education really have gotten good training on how to juggle all the responsibilities placed on us. It. It's right back to that whole just figure it out, right? We're going to give you a list of 3,000 things you need to get done and you just work it out somehow. To compound the problem, efficiency and productivity are often not even identified as a goal within our school systems. And this leaves principals floundering to figure out their own methods to achieve specific numbers and data points with no support in figuring out how they or their teachers are supposed to fit everything in. There's an unspoken false equivalency between being efficient and taking shortcuts. So we kind of have this mindset in education that if you're doing things in a way that is easier and faster, then it must automatically be worse for children. So to even ask about finding a way to simplify a new mandated requirement can be perceived within educational culture as a lack of dedication or a lack of care. And we have to push back against this patently dangerous myth. When a school leader is not taught how to have efficient systems in place for their work, that impact trickles down to every person in the building. A constantly overworked and frazzled administrator creates stress for everyone around them. When admins are behind or miss deadlines, when they require duplicate submission of paperwork because they lost the first set, when they spend inordinate amounts of time disciplining, when they're constantly in pointless meetings which pull them away from classrooms, all of these things prevent every adult in the building from doing their best. So the solution is reimagining systems and norms using small yet powerful tweaks to the way we do school in order to recover hundreds of hours of lost time for staff. Taking control of your own time 
is an essential part of being a good leader, whether you're a leader of a classroom, a school, a district, or so on. Taking control of your own time is what equips you to show up each day rested, focused, and fully present with the people who need you. Additionally, the way that you approach your work impacts how everyone else in the building approaches theirs. When you streamline your communication, your meetings, your email, your parent correspondence, your behavioral policies, and so on, you also help streamline the workflow of all your teachers. So even with significant restrictions at the district, state, or federal level, those in school leadership especially have significant and often unrecognized power to transform school culture. And your lens becomes your practice. The way you perceive your challenges impacts the kind of solutions you can envision for them. Our goal through the 40-hour leadership program is to ensure that principals see their school through a lens that is human-centered, compassionate, and focused on what matters most rather than upholding the status quo. When a person believes that's possible and desirable, when it's possible for educators to do a great job for kids and center their own work-life balance, that belief will color how you perceive your school's operations. You will begin to naturally filter all information and decision-making through that perception and make decisions based on sustainable practices rather than urgent stopgap measures. So here's how the 40-hour leadership course can help if you want support in these areas. I'm going to be providing guidance and coaching on everything I've shared here and a whole lot more. And that is through this new 40-hour leadership course that's launching this summer to a beta group of administrators at a special introductory price. We will begin taking applications for that right away. It is a self-paced course. It's delivered through PDF and audio modules. So administrators, and by administrators, I mean any school leader, assistant, principal, anyone else on the admin team, um, can either read it or listen to the audio. And it's me speaking to you just like I'm speaking here. So if this was valuable, the course is basically going to give you more of that and more structure and practical information. It's designed for all K-12 schools. So if you are on the administrative team for your school, or if you're a teacher or you have another position and you think your principal or AP might like support in finding a more sustainable approach to their job and supporting teachers in work-life balance, pass on this link. It's join.40htw.com forward slash leadership. Or just go to 40htw.com, 40htw.com, and you'll see it in the nav menu, the link to the leadership course. 40-hour leadership is based on the premise that no system can be considered best for kids if it causes the adults to burn out and subsequently underperform or quit. So we offer solutions that consider not only what's best for kids, but also what is sustainable and manageable for the adults in the building that are responsible for them. We believe that all staff members, everyone working in a school, leadership, custodians, school psychologists, counselors, aides, teachers, the, sec the secretary, office staff, everyone in that school building has inherent value as a human being. They are not disposable cogs to be used up and then replaced. If we want to reduce the attrition crisis, if we want to have awesome people working in our schools, we have to prioritize the well-being and work-life balance of those people. So the 40-hour leadership program gives administrators and other school leaders simple tools to support their own personal development and organization, as well as professional development, and reduce extraneous and unnecessary work for teachers to protect instructional and planning time. So 40-hour leadership is going to be available starting in early June. That is when the regular 40-hour teacher workweek program and a new 40-hour instructional coaching program will begin. So teachers can join through July 15th. And for the leadership and coaching courses, which are not year-long programs, those can be purchased anytime. And that will be available. We're, as I said, we're taking applications for the beta group now. Um, and it will be available for purchase in mid-June. Your administrative team should plan to invest about 7 to 10 hours into completing the 40-hour leadership program. And I think you'll get a massive return on that investment of time. There are five steps to the program. It's five modules, which can be completed over the summer or during the school year at any pace you'd like. And again, you can learn more at join.40htw.com forward slash leadership, or just go to 40htw.com and you'll see it in the nav. 
Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is circling back to something that I shared earlier, and it's this. Teachers' unpaid work hours are not free labor for the school. There is a limit to the amount of time a teacher can spend working without compensation, reward, recognition, or advancement. There is a breaking point beyond which teachers' goodwill towards students cannot be stretched. Every new expectation placed on teachers requires an expenditure of their time and energy, and the school pays a price for that in burnout and attrition. In order for educators to keep doing an awesome job for kids for years to come, we have to decide, both individually and collectively, to change our systems, to change the way we do school. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.